talk. I'm giving, the talk I'm giving today is about a piece of the assimilation project, uh, which is the discovery piece. And I'm passing around something here which has a lot, lot more detail than you can possibly understand. And the point of it is, it, what it is, by the way, I'll explain, is discovery information from four machines at my house. And it's drawn as a graph, so it's just, the point of this is to really say, look at all that stuff, man. So, uh, not that you would follow it all, because I have trouble following it all. So, the assimilation project uh, is a project which does discovery and monitoring together. And it has, it does the discovery to create a CMDB. And it, the, the interesting thing about the discovery is that it doesn't have any network footprint. So, it doesn't port scan and it doesn't ping. And uh, the monitoring, when I say it, it's integrated together with the monitoring, the monitoring is extreme scale. By that I mean hundreds of thousands of servers and up. So, uh, really on one server, perhaps out of your laptop, uh, you know, you might want to have a lot of RAM to do that, maybe a lot of disk to keep track of all the data, but it's, you know, you know processing power, it's not going to take a lot. And the result of this discovery is that we create a CMDB, Configuration Management Database, describing what you have, what it does, and how the pieces relate to each other. And that's what the, this, that's a graphical representation of the CMDB for my house that's going around. I apologize, I didn't bring a third one, so if you want to see one afterwards, they'll, hopefully they'll eventually come back and we can show them to whoever else might be interested. So, a little bit about using a CMDB for different reasons. There are different reasons why you want this data. Lots of different reasons why you want this data. One of them is risk man management mitigation. Fundamentally, system administration does two things. It's provide a service and that's maybe 20% of the job. And 80% of the job is risk management around that service. By risk management, I mean present, pr protecting your job, protecting your company's revenue stream, protecting you from bad people, uh, keeping your, you know, keep having your boss keep his job. All those things are risk management one way or another. For example, with intrusions, about 30% of all people who break into sites from the outside do it through machines that have, people have forgotten about. And it doesn't matter if you have Puppet managing all the machines you know about if you've forgotten about the one that the guys break in on. So part of the process of discovery here is to see all the things you have, including those you might have forgotten about. We also discover licensed software. We know where you're, we're actually running, for example, copies of Oracle or something. And there, that's a risk management issue too. If you have too many licenses, then you paid a lot of money because Oracle is very, very proud of their software. And if... <laughs> And, and, if you, and, if you, um, and if you have too few licenses, then you have a serious risk. In the US, that risk is minimum of a $500,000 fine. So uh, I don't know what it is here, but uh, I'm sure that Oracle is just as happy to be aggressive here as they are in the US. So there are also audits that your company has to perform, and there are different reasons for those audits, and you're at risk for not passing those audits and not having your processes match what you actually do in spite of the tools you have because there are things that you might not know about or things that might not comply with the way you intended to manage the systems. Uh, also, things like system modeling. If you, you know, I have this system over here and someone comes along and says, yeah, yeah, we're gonna have this big plan and we're gonna make everything look like that. And they say, well, okay, how are you gonna do that? Well, we're gonna take this and make it look like that. You say, well, okay, what does it actually look like today? Well, I don't know, we're just gonna make it look like that. And so it's good to know what it actually looks like if you want to have a plan to make it look like that, right? Sorry if I'm messing you guys up there with a the video camera. Um, but you, know, you want to have a plan for transforming it. And you want to be able to tell on an ongoing basis whether you're making any progress. You know, what does it look like today? Well, we're, how far are you along in the plan? Well, we're almost done. And you look at the graph of the, of the system and it looks the same as it did when you started. Maybe you didn't make that much progress. So the lots, and, and of course outages from the, so the understanding how to manage your outages and so on, that's really more of the other part of the proje project, not the configuration, man uh, the CMDB part. But I'll have, I have a talk on that on Wednesday, a little longer than this 15 minute talk. So how many people here think their documentation is complete and correct? <laughs> oh, one person. Okay, if it's incomplete and incorrect, then maybe we can do a better job of, uh, by having it be automatically created and updated all the time. Uh, how many of you think you know all the dependencies between your pieces? <laughs> so we also discover dependencies. It's not perfect, but the ones we discover are real, and you might not know about them all. Planning, again, you need accurate data. Best practices. You know, for example, I use a database here called Neo4j. Neo4j wants you to have at least 50,000 open file descriptors on the machine. I think it's 50,000. Uh, in, in order to operate it correctly. Well, 
uh, how many machines do I have I'm running the O4J on that don't have that set correctly? Well, if I've discovered you know, the ULimit stuff and I've discovered which machines are running the O4J, I can write a query in the graph database that tells me what machines I have that are running the O4J that don't happen to have at least 50,000 open file descriptors. And I don't have to go ping all the machines because the data is always up to date. So, and compliance and all that stuff which relates to audits. Our discovery is interesting because it's continuous, it's continually updating, very low overhead and low profile, both on the clients that, that this runs on and on the server in, in, the, in the center part. So we do that continuously. We don't have any network footprint to really none except to actually take the data we've collected and put it in one place. Discovery drives our monitoring. So you can actually ask the question of what all services am I offering that I am not monitoring, right? I can ask that question, and that's a query in the database, and you can answer that question and say, oh, well, maybe I want to monitor those, or maybe I don't want to provide them, you know, either way. It's very extensible, and I'll show you how to extend it yourself. It's designed to be extended by system administrators. Uh, it, has configura it is configuration free. The stuff that's on that, there was zero configuration given to my software at all to discover the stuff on that picture that's going around. I told it nothing. It told me. Isn't that nice? Computers are nice, but they can actually tell you things. You shouldn't have to tell them things that they can figure out. So what kind of things do we discover? IP and MAC addresses, which are implicitly are servers. We also discover services and service details, like what, you know, what user ID is it running as, what the current directory is, uh, what, what the command line, you know, if it's a Java thing, it might be a command line like that. And, uh, also, what switches are connected to your service, servers? Let's say ETH0 on this machine is connected to switch port 5 on that switch. We know that stuff. We discover it again without sending out packets just by listening. As, as, as someone says, as a, you know, a Forrest Gump kind of thing, my mama always used to tell me it's amazing what you can learn just by listening. So we listen to what there is to hear. We don't have to, you know, if you listen to our packets, you can discover every IP address. You don't have to ping. They're going to tell you. It's true. It's true. Just listen. So we also discover OS configuration and stuff like that. And I'll give you an example for OS configuration in a minute because it's really easy and it fits on the screen. And also you can discover whatever you want. The point of this is, is to drop the microphone, which I've done successfully now twice, so I'm highly successful. And uh, so, so it is to create community. Part of what will make this successful is to have people say, oh, I care about this and I know how to discover it. So I'll give you the script, we'll put it in the open source project and you can go away and discover it now. Somebody else says, well, now that you've discovered that, I know this thing about Oracle and how it should be configured and I can write a script that comes through and does an audit to see whether you're following best practices, right? Those kind of things all together. This is the kind of thing communities do really, really well. And so, Architecturally, we have two pieces, and I'm going to talk about the two pieces briefly as we go forward. We have something in the center. This is the assimilation monitoring project, and yes, we call our things that you put in your machine, our agents, nanoprobes. And so as a result, the, the central system has to be called the collective management authority for managing the collective now that we've assimilated you with our nanoprobes. For those of you who don't know the Star Trek jokes, I apologize. <laughs> Clearly some do. Um, every machine, uh, has a nanoprobe running on it, and one system in the middle has, or wherever in the side or wherever, runs this collective management authority stuff. So how does discovery work? We have the nanoprobe agents on every machine, they run scripts, and the scripts spit out JSON. How many people here can write a script that spits out JSON? Yeah, pretty much everybody. Those, the rest of you have, aren't awake. I know you can spit, do it. So you take arguments from the environment potentially and, and you know, might fine tune exactly how you wanted to collect it. And then you spit out JSON. And so we run those periodically on, every, on the agents on the nanoprobes. And if the answer we get back is the same as the answer we got last time, we throw it away. If it's different, we send it to the CMA and update the database. Excellent. Uh, so we store it in the JSON, in the, in, a, in the Neo4j database, and we have discovery plugins which can process them and do other things with them for some cases. So here's an example of JSON's uh, snippet for discovering. This is the actual output from that discovers what OS you're running. And it has the, this is the uname stuff plus some LSB something or another that tells you things. I always forget what the code name is for the different versions of Ubuntu, so now I know. It will tell me that it's raring, right, or whatever it happens to be. 
so, so it, this, this is a script that runs and tells you what OS you're running, right? That information now is in the central database, so I don't have to tell it what OS you're running. It tells me what OS it's running and a lot of detailed data. So it also creates graphs that look like this. For those, those of you who don't see, don't have, have the opportunity to see that graph yet, there are IP, there's NICs on here, there's a ser server here, IP addresses, IP port combinations. Uh, uh, processes like SSHD that are listening and processes like SSH that are c uh, connecting. So we actually can see a dependency on this between the SSH and the SSHD that shows up because we've discovered all of this information. Uh, I, I'm really running out of time. So we do the same thing here for switches with LL, LLDP and CDP. That's how we figure out what switch ports are connected to where. We listen to LLDP or CDP, which is pretty much every switch that you would have in production would support that and most of them have it turned on. But most of the time, no one listens to it. And so this is our current status. I apologize for being quite so quick, but it, that's how it's gonna be. First release was uh, April of last year. I tried to put out a release before I came here, but the, but the guy who was doing continuous integration had just ripped apart all the CI stuff, and so it wasn't working that day, so. Oh well, I got on the plane and flew out here anyway. But it's licensed under the GPL, commercial options are available, and my point here is to have you get involved. We need every kind of talent. There's practically nothing that we don't need someone to help us do. If you have a talent, how many people have at least one talent? <laughs> well, some of our see don't have any, are talent free, but for the rest of you, you know, we, this is an opportunity to come do something that's very interesting. It really scales to hundreds of thousands of servers, really. If you want to hear how, come to my talk on Wednesday. Um, but we need every kind of talent, and just remember that Resistance is futile. <laughs> so, this all, yeah, the com com I try and combine as many bad jokes as possible in the, in the software because we have a ring in here and we have a various hierarchy of rings and the one at the top doesn't have a name so I figured I had to call it the one ring. So, <laughs> so um, the, the one that rules over the other rings. This, one ring to rule them all. So anyway, so this is the project, this is what we're doing, and this is uh, the simulation project, and this is the piece that does discovery. Thanks for your time. Oh, well, I, I figured you'd just fall off again. Oh, I'm happy to take questions, by the way. I just didn't know who's next. Oh, questions. Yes, right here. Um, Quick. So, can it do, does it do hardware? Does it do everything? Is it going to tell me how much RAM I've got? Yes. Cool. <laughs> yes. How hard is it to install? Um, well, on, on Debian, can you install a package? You install the package, you install the CMA on one machine, and install the nanoprobe on every machine, and you start them. That's it. Uh, so, we discover that it exists if it has an IP address. We discover what's in it only by having a probe on it. So, you're not doing querying over IPMI? N not today. Okay. I'm, trying to, I'm trying to make it where people can install this and not get fired. <laughs> okay. That, how many people think that's a good goal? Okay. All right. Yes. Question. Well, it's supposed to run on anything, and I've, I, originally I, I have seen it run on Windows in the past. I haven't seen it run recently because my Windows guy has, a, has a medical problems, and he hasn't been able to do it. I'm happy to, that's another example of where I'd like to have someone else, right? What language is it written in? Uh, the nanoprobes are written in C. Uh, the nanoprobe agent is written in C. The scripts are written in whatever they're written in, and the central system is written in Python. Okay. Sorry. Thank you very much.